Alrighty, what is going on everyone? Welcome back to another video in my design guide series. So this is where I go over, um, I covered those circuits that aren't quite big enough to warrant their own e projects video, but they're still very relevant, very necessary to learn how to design them. And so I, I want to go over some in-depth component analysis and explain the sort of uh, method of operation mechanism of action of these circuits. So this is a good follow-up video to the EMI basics video I did in my EE fundamental series where I kind of introduced the concept of EMI and explained like how it's a problem and I kind of introduced some ideas to mitigate it, right? And the last thing I touched on was this EMI input filter. So today I want to do an in-depth in -depth analysis and explain how to select values for your EMI filter. So the first thing I kind of want to start off by saying is that EMI filters, these values that we're looking at are ultimately chosen and vetted through testing, right? So no amount of like calculation or simulation is going to beat good old fashioned testing and say, yeah, we tested it and it works. Okay. Um, so what this design guide is really going to be for is to help you with the initial component selection. Like, let's say you've never, like you're designing a brand new power supply and you've never you don't have any guide whatsoever to no reference schematics or anything to go off of in order to design your EMI filter so how do you go about selecting those initial component values right um, so hopefully you if you if you haven't watched that EMI basics definitely go do that before because I explained what the names of all these components are and what their jobs are so what I'll do is I'm just gonna start jumping into each component and explaining how we calculate values for it, right? Um, so like I said, we have our Y caps, our CM choke, and our pi filter are basically the, the main areas I'll be covering. Okay, so like I said, EMI filters are ultimately vetted through testing, yes. Um, so yeah, these are guidelines for initial component selection. Okay, so the first thing, first thing up is a Y capacitor selection. So like I said, the Y cap's job is to attenuate the common mode noise. Um, and so the main, the, it's kind of interesting, you'll see when we go down, there are kind of different considerations for each component. And so the main consideration for initially choosing a Y capacitor is its leakage current. So leakage current is going to be the amount of current, because you know Y caps go from line and neutral to chassis. and this is supposed to be act as a safety ground, right? So we don't want this this line hot like under like any circumstances. Um, which so it means by um, by regulation or by um, there are standards, right? Which say we only allow so much leakage current through these capacitors during normal operation in order for it to be considered like you know safe. So. Um, with that being said, the typical safety standards allow for 0 0.5 milliamps of leakage current, right? So we don't want more than 0 0.5 milliamps of leakage current flowing through these capacitors to chassis, okay? So, like I said, great. So how do we use this information to, to initially select the capacitance of our Y capacitor? So, here's where we start out. So we know our line voltage, or at least we know we have it spec for our power supply right our line voltage and in this case right i have it at 265 vac and the reason i have that value is because we want to choose worst case scenarios for this okay so we have our worst case scenario line voltage and 265 volts ac and the reason i have volts ac is because we haven't made it to the rectifier yet so we're not dealing with 375 volts dc we're dealing with 265 ac right now we have the line frequency is 60 hertz. Again, this is a worst case scenario for us. Um, we know our allowable leakage current. So then we can calculate the, the minimum necessary impedance, aka reactance, of our capacitor because as you know, capacitor's impedance varies with frequency. And since we know the frequency, we can calculate our capacitor's reactance. And so we can calculate the amount of current that is flowing through the capacitor at a particular frequency, okay? So here in the notes I said, so we have our allowable leakage current of 0 0.5 milliamps. So we, again, as engineers, we don't wanna design things at, at the absolute limit, 
the absolute allowable limit because if there's imperfect components for circuit for whatever reason it's an operating like it normally should we don't want the last thing we want to do is for our circuit to become unsafe we'd rather it break and destroy itself before it becomes unsafe okay so for that reason we're gonna we're gonna give us a huge margin we're gonna go down by a factor of 10 from 0.5 milliamps to 0 0.05 milliamps just to have a nice margin right and so we know like we know v equals ir right it's the same exact equation but instead of r we have reactants and so we're dividing that over to calculate our reactants and reactants equals one over two pi times the frequency times our capacitance so we plug in our values here and it spits out a reactance of 5.3 mega ohms this is a mega ohm right so we know that our capacitor has to be putting up 5.3 mega ohms of impedance at a, at a frequency of 60 hertz so then we plug in our values 2 pi times 60 hertz times c equals you know c equals this so here we get a value of around 500 picofarads and this is so this is the maximum capacitance we want for our y caps and let me see so they choose 2200 again so they're they're like so this is like i said this value is for an initial selection um so if you look at 2200 picofarad so like let's we'll just do some quick napkin math right we we reduced our le allowable leakage by a factor of 10 which means the real limit is about 5000 picofarad so that means that they're still well within their allowable their their tolerance range um but I'm just what I'm saying is that if we put a 500 picofarad Y cap on there and our circuit passes EMI, then we're great, right? Because we're extremely safe and our circuit is effective. Okay, and that's all. That's what we want at the end of the day. So we don't need to push the, the envelope anymore. Whenever, whenever 500 picofarads works, right? So this is a fine value to pick for our, our initial selection. Okay. So the next thing moving on is our X capacitor selection. So the X cap's job is to filter out differential mode noise. Let me see if I showed. Yeah, like I said X cap's right here. Um, there's a filter out differential mode noise. So the main consideration for choosing an X cap is going to be its power factor. Um, so go ahead and watch. Go watch my video on how to calculate power factor if you haven't already, because I just go in, in detail on how to do that calculation. Um, I kind of even show an example of it right here as well. When there, obviously we have to, to figure out what our power factor. So, given that we we need the line voltage, line frequency, output power, and we can calculate the power factor. Um, so, like I said, we're going to assume a line voltage of 265 volts AC. Worst case scenario, 60 hertz. And so, in this case, the output power I just selected it to be 120 watts for an example. And so we know power factor is going to be true power divided by apparent power. And so what I have here is set minimum power factor to be 0.96. So the key with, with your power factor is you can have a, a power factor of one is as high as you can get, right? Um, but you don't necessarily want to be too, too greedy and start like start out trying to get a power factor of like 0.99999 or something. So, um, because again like it's power factor doesn't affect the safety of the circuit it just affects the you know, efficacy of the circuit right when we're emi is our number one consideration in this case so whenever you have whenever push comes to shove we are choosing mitigating emi over having a good power factor so like i said we're just setting the minimum power factor to be 0.96 this is a very generous amount 0.96 is is pretty easy number to hit um so i don't i don't think we have to worry about it so like I said, we're having true power plus reactive power is equal to 125 squared. Um, I calculated this value from, this is, just go watch my video on calculating power factor if you want to understand where I got these from. So I just know that our reactive power needs to be 135 or needs sorry it needs to be 35 uh, volts amp reactants or VARs, right? So we have this our reactive power, right? So this is gonna be the power that's 
is the the x cap is dissipating all right so going over here we have 35 var equals 265 times the current going through the capacitor so we know that i is 132 milliamps again a familiar equation v equals i x c 265 equals 132 xc xc is about you know 2000 ohms right 2007 ohms and that is equal to 1 over 2 pi fc and then we just kind of do our algebra basic algebra here and that gives us a value of 1.32 microfarads this is for our maximum capacitance right any higher and we would we would fall below our power factor threshold of 0.96 so we arbitrarily said right i mean like i said ideally we want something like 0.99999 so um, we want to select a value we want to select a value but it's much smaller than this anyways um so yeah so like i said this is our maximum value and if you look up here in the example i have they selected of something of 0.33 microfarads right so that's roughly a third of our of our you know maximum um capacitance right so you can just you know i would say you can just pick a value around that if you wanted to in this case um, but just know don't pick anything over 1.32 all right so the next thing we're going to cover is the selection of the common mode choke the common mode choke is job to attenuate common mode noise so the way you go about selecting a common mode choke is you need to look at the data sheet of your choke and look at its um, attenuation versus frequency right so whenever we're designing our flyback converter we know that the switching frequency is we know it right so in this case i just say it's 100 kilohertz right so that means we know that our uh, signal waveform is going to have a fundamental at 100 kilohertz and we know it's like a triangle wave or a sawtooth wave right so that means it's going to have some harmonics in the upper frequency uh, in, the, in the upper frequency spectrum or above that right so you know fundamental at 100 kilohertz and then above that you'll have you know upper harmonics right hopefully you're familiar with doing Fourier transform and understanding what all the different what a sawtooth wave versus a square wave versus a triangle wave what those all look like and so um, just understand that you need something that will be able to attenuate so this is attenuation in db so this is how much it, it ducks the signal by right so you see we start out this is 100 kilohertz right here so we're giving like 10 10 db of attenuation and then it just increases as we go into upper harmonic range right so this is amount of attenu attenuation right so this is how much it'll reduce the signal by so higher values is what we're looking for um so this is like i said this is a just look for a value that look for a curve that looks like it'll fit your application and again ultimately ultimately we're going to be experimenting and testing to figure out if this is a good fit or not because you could always just swap out and you know chokes um and test a different one if you want to so like i said make sure it attenuates enough at the desired frequencies so in our case like i said we need 100 kilohertz and above it needs to be attenuating and it's doing a pretty good job right we're, we're attenuating more and more as we go up this frequency spectrum um okay so the next thing is the filtering inductor so this is going to be sort of that pi filter setup we have right here right so this is the this is known as a filtering inductor right here sorry about that um okay filtering inductor selection so the filtering inductor's job is to attenuate differential mode noise the filter filtering inductor forms a low pass filter with the input capacitor so the, this is this part is kind of not intuitive if you look at designs you will have it looks very confusing because you'll see plenty of designs and i guess i'll have to go back up there where their filtering inductor setup that doesn't really make any sense like you we have all these different capacitor values here we have 0 0.33 0 0.33 0 0.47 and if you know anything about flyback converters, you know that we usually we have a really big bulk capacitor to filter that to smooth this signal, right? We know a 0.47 microfarad capacitor is not going to do it. 
right? So kind of when you look at, at design, sometimes they have something like this set up or sometimes they just have a couple big bulk capacitors set up, right? And there's a lot of really advanced design theory behind the selection of those values, but I'll say the, we'll, we'll say the rough around the edges, the most standard way of doing it is just, just partition your capacitors out. Have one capacitor do one job and another capacitor do another job. So for example, just have one dedicated capacitor for your input value, right? So you have been, you know, you have the two to three microfarads per watt of input power, right? Um, so you can use that value to calculate your input capacitor, but then you can also have independent an independent capacitor that forms your pi filter. So you just you can pick any value you want. Um, you can end up with a really like a forty five nanofarad capacitor in a sixty eight microhenry inductor or something like that, right? So it just gives you more freedom on your inductor capacitor selections independently. Um, but you'll see some engineers, they kind of combine the, those values into one capacitor, and we can talk about that later. But that's like extremely advanced design theory. And we'll say what will work is if you just have dedicated input capacitor, dedicated pi filter capacitor, and you should be totally fine there. So in this example I laid out, we have 100 kilohertz switching frequency. So we want to set our cutoff frequency. So this is forming a low pass filter. So we want we want to set up our uh, cutoff frequency to be around 100 kilohertz. And in this case, what it is just for simplicity's sake in calculation, I just assumed a CN of 300 microfarads because, um, like I said, I did the two three microfarads per watt. Um, that way, it's just to me it would be simpler in this case uh, just to assume a CN value. Um, so yeah, just assume a CN of 300 microfarads for this this calculation. So going in, we have 100 kilohertz equals one over pi times the square root of 300 microfarads times the inductance. So we just do some algebra, more algebra, and we come out to a value of 337 microhenries for our inductor selection. And like I said, um, if you wanted to have a dedicated capacitor, because in this case, like I said, I used CN as the value to form the low pass filter, but you can pick a different CN, that way you can get a much lower inductor, a lo much lower inductance value if you wanted to. And that has other advantages for like efficiency and size and of your inductor and stuff like that. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on is like a, a general um, guideline for picking all these components is you got to make sure those auxiliary parameters are met. For example, Y capacitors, you got to make sure your voltage rating is appropriate, right? So Y caps need to be rated above 265 in this case. Um, X cap needs to be above 265. Your common mode choke needs to have a, the appropriate current rating. So calculate, make sure you know that the, the current flowing through this part of the circuit, make sure your inductor, make sure your choke is rated above that. Same thing goes for our pi filter components, right? Picking CN down here, make sure that it is rated above 375 in that case, right? Cause you're, you are rectifying 265 at this past this point. Right, um, and then the same thing goes for your filtering inductor. Make sure its current rating is appropriate as well. So make sure you know the current flowing through that part of the circuit. Um, so those are just some some other tips I want to make sure you have there. So yeah, that that covers it for my EMI input filter design guide. Um, if you have any questions, just drop them in the comments below, and I I can I can I'll be more than happy to make follow up videos on this topic. Anything else? Um, Drop a like if this video helped you out at all. It would help me out a ton. Um, was if you liked or, or just dislike if you don't like it either. That's fine with me. Um, also subscribe if you want to see more content related to you know electrical engineering and I just talk about anything that I think is relevant for uh, you know PCB design, electronic circuit design, um, all that type of stuff. So uh, yeah, thank you so much if you made it this far.